Good evening and welcome to the last lecture of the Distinguished Lecture Series at the WZB. We heard during the year a lecture by economists, by sociologists, by a political scientist, and finally we have a, can I call you Bruce, a constitutionalist who is a lawyer by training, uh, but from time to time he cannot refrain to dive into the lowlands of politics. So he talks and writes about politics as well. At present, Bruce has the eminent privilege to be here as a spouse, to be here as a spouse of Susan Rose Ackerman, who is a fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg here in Berlin. I think this is one of the best positions one can have. Maybe even better than the position you normally have in your normal life as a Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University since 1987. Before, he was, among others, a law clerk to a judge, Henry J. Friendly, at the US Court of Appeals. The next year, a law uh, clerk to the Justice John Harlan at the US Supreme Court. But then he left uh, the real world of courts, writing about them, became an assistant professor of law at the University of Pens Pennsylvania at the law school. Later, he took on a position of law and public policy analysis at the University of Pennsylvania as well. And finally, in 1974, he became a professor of law at Yale University. Don't be afraid, not only because I'm anyway uh, threatened to lose my voice if I talk longer than five minutes. Uh, don't be afraid that I will present all the publications of Bruce Ackerman here, 18 books translated in different languages, and his opus magnum is on We the People. Uh, the third volume just appeared, The Civil Rights Revolution, uh, and we are uh, curious about to know how many volumes we still have to expect. But he also wrote about uh, topics like the decline and fall of the American Republic. It's very interesting to hear, Bruce, that there is already, has already been a fall of the American Republic, or before the next attack at Yale University Press, the failure of founding fathers, and for political scientists, a quite interesting and innovative book on Deliberation Day, meaning there should be a national holiday where the people deliberate about the different merits of the candidates running for uh, membership in the parliament. Most recently, he also uh, wrote a short uh, but extremely interesting article on reviving democratic citizenship. And he argues in this article that we need an ambitious reform of uh, the revival of democratic life. And he proposes four factors. I've just named these factors. A campaign finance initiative granting each voter 50 Patriot dollars to fund candidates and political parties of his or her choice. The second proposal is this national holiday, a deliberation day. The third one, a system of federally financed electronic news vouchers to permit professional journalism to survive the destruction of its traditional business model. And last but not least, a new form of citizenship inheritance, which provide, please listen, which provides $80,000 to all Americans as they start off life uh, as adults. This obviously has something to do with 
an equality of life chances as well. But Bruce Ackermann is not only a leading, globally leading constitutionalist, he's also a public voice in the p debate in the United States, writing quite often in the New York Times and other widespread magazines and media. Today he will talk about uh, three paths to constitutionalism and their authoritarian alternatives. And as we always uh, do here in this distinguished lectures, we have two commentators. And the th rule is that these commentators are coming from different disciplines. So we have uh, Ruth Koopmans here. He is directing the Department on Immigration. I don't know exactly what he is. He is a kind of sociologist, but also political scientist. Uh, and then we have uh, Michael Hutter. He leads the Department of uh, Cultural Sources of Innovation. So we are looking forward. Welcome, Bruce, to the lecture. The floor is yours. Second here. This, aha, there's already, the, 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 I've been anticipated here. Good. Uh, the beginning of this lecture, uh, uh, really, uh, it's taken a long time for, for it to generate, uh, 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 was uh, uh, when uh, my wife and I spent a year in Berlin uh, in uh, 1991 and 92. At that time, I was uh, a fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg, uh, and I wrote a book um, called The Future of Liberal Revolution uh, 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 about uh, the events in Eastern Europe. Um, and. Um, uh, I was, uh, you know, really, I really put my heart into it, and in four or five or six months, uh, there was a book, you know, and I showed it to Wolf Lepenese. He said, we have to translate it into German immediately. Uh, and so he took me to uh, Wolf Ziedler, who is the head of Ziedler Verlag, uh, who had read the book. I was really, most people in the publishing business uh, often offer me contracts, they'd never read the book. That's, you know, that's not what they do. Um, uh, he read it, he said, you know, this is really very interesting, uh, Herr Professor Dr. Ackermann, or whatever. Uh, he was a gentleman, you know, I mean, really, of the old school. Um, I only have one, one condition for publishing this book. We need a new title, Revolution doesn't sell in Germany. <laughs> and here it is, Ein neuer Anfang für Europa. <laughs> no. um, uh, and as you'll see, this, uh, this talk can be understood, among other things, as a meditation on uh, this uh, event of, uh, of uh, some years ago. <clears throat> okay. Uh, law, uh, let me just make sure I know what time it is. It's a quarter after six, okay. A law legitimates power. It's not enough for the state to force its citizens to obey. Coercion is governed by principle, or so official propaganda machines proclaim, sometimes credibly. Constitutionalism is a part of this larger project of legitimation. But how do constitutions gain their claim to authority? How do they engage with other modes of legitimation uh, in each regime's ongoing effort to justify itself? I'll be exploring these questions in the spirit of Max Weber, who famously distinguished four ways in which power establishes its authority uh, by appealing to charisma, bureaucratic uh, rationality, tradition, or substantive rationality, substantive rights, correct us. It's past uh, time to move beyond Weber's famous list. I want to give constitutionalism a central place in a new series of ideal types that clarify the modes of authority uh, dominant in the 20th century, for the obvious reason that constitutionalism is one of the foundational ways that power justifies itself today. 
Um, uh, and by constitutionalism, I should say, it's for me, uh, is not a, a, a synonym for liberal democracy or everything that you like or think is good. Um, uh, uh, it, not at all. Uh, it's the idea that law, in one way or another, constrains top decision makers. Okay. I'll begin by sketching three paths to constitutionalism, which serve as the foundation for my ideal types. The first path starts with the birth of modern understandings, as they emerged during the American, French, and Latin American revolutions of the 18th century. Over the course of the next two centuries, the idea of revolutionary constitutionalism has swept the world. Under this scenario, a mobilized movement of revolutionary outsiders defined by the system as outsiders um, actually wins and uses the Constitution. Of course, most of the time they get crushed. But they sometimes win. And they use the Constitution to elaborate the principles that motivated them in time one. We'll call the mobilization phase, the mass mobilization phase time one, and the founding phase is at time two. Right? Um, and these constitutions contain principles and institutions which constrain authority. They don't have to be liberal principles. There are liberal revolutionary constitutions and anti-enlightenment constitutions. The uh, uh, fundamental constitution of the uh, uh, Islamic Republic of Iran was written in Paris by uh, a, a professor at the Sorbonne. Um, and then was changed a good deal, but nonetheless is uh, demonstrably at work today in Iran. Um, the, um, uh, since the uh, revolutionary mobilization challenges the regime, uh, it often uh, gains power through violence, as in the case of the United States, the American, you know, George Washington. Who is George Washington? He is the shaker of our, he's the, he's the first guerrilla leader who actually wins. That's all he is. He's, you know, he loses all the cities during the, civil, during the American Revolution. He's in a place called Valley Forge with a very small number of people. What is Valley Forge? Not any of the big cities. He's lost them, and he then makes little attacks. The, uh, 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 similarly, uh, in uh, South Africa, another revolutionary constitutional scenario uh, of the 20th century, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, African National Congress uh, uh, is a, uh, 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 in large measure for a generation, uh, um, a military organization. Uh, 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 which engages in massive guerrilla warfare. Uh, 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 but sometimes, of course, during time one, um, I would think of a case like, uh, 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 most notably, India, to which we'll return, uh, uh, we see, uh, uh, here we have a mass mobilization led by Gandhi for a generation, then he passes it over and the movement becomes something which is going to be very important in this uh, talk, the idea of a movement party. Um, which then, in the 1930s, Gandhi resigns as head of the Congress party and hands over the torch to Nehru, a very different fellow indeed, who wants to win elections, <laughs> which, he, which he, the British permit him to make a serious a stab at in 1935 when they passed the Government of India Act. <clears throat> so um, that's time one, and then uh, after the uh, Second World War, the Congress party wins. Right. And in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, 1950, we have a constitution. Back, we'll go back there uh, soon enough. Um, while revolutionary constitutionalism has had many victories in the last two centuries, it's also had many defeats. Great Britain, for example, repudiated the French Revolution as a model for legitimate change during the Napoleonic War. 
instead of allowing outsiders to gain control and then revolutionize the system, uh, it has developed an insider path to constitutional development. You know, 1832, the first Reform Act. Right? Here are these screamers and yellers outside saying, you know, votes for everyone, votes, votes, votes. You know. Well, I'm not going to give you the gory details of how the Duke of Wellington uh, was pushed to one side by Earl Grey and all this, but nonetheless, the outsiders didn't take over. See, the insiders said, hmm, you know, let these screamy, yelly people, we'll give them a strategic concession. There aren't these grand principles, that's screamy, yelly stuff. The insiders make prudent concessions and generate precedents, not abstract principles, <laughs> um, which is, cons you know, you know in, in 1911, um, uh, when the king is threatening the House of Lords with packing the Lords beca because of another big screamy yelly thing going on, um, people are looking back to 1832, what actually happened? Well, you know, was once somebody says one thing, there are lots of different interpretations of 1832, I assure you. Um, this is a very different brand of constitutionalism than, but it is constitutionalism, this idea they don't have constitutionalism in Britain is ridiculous, uh, than, you know, the uh, American or Indian uh, or South African grand principles, which have mobilized millions of people behind them. Okay. Um, the British uh, system of insider constitutionalism, we'll call it, has had not only effect in, in uh, Britain, but a profound effect in many Commonwealth countries. The most notably are Canada, Australia, and, um, uh, and New Zealand, but we can find many uh, influences in what was formerly the British Empire and to some degree beyond. Um, so we have then two ideal types, uh, outsider revolutions and insider evolutions. Um, there's a third type. See, you, if we're going to have ideal types, I don't want 111, please. I don't want one. <laughs> I want some clear, simple ideas like outsiders taking over inside, insiders, you know, saying, we hear you. Oh, I guess, oh, you know, the outsiders are satisfied, sort of, in a grumpy way, you know. Or at least they run out of steam. Um, the third model is the regime has a crisis, and insiders reach out to outside elites. Outside elites. But they don't, but neither insiders or outsiders appeal for popular mobilized support. Beautiful case is Franco Spain. Franco is contemplating his death, as we all try not to do, but he does, and he um, says, you know, I'm going to appoint a king as my successor. Very odd, very fascinating juridical thing for a dictator to do, to appoint a king as his successor. He does that, uh, he trains up Juan Carlos, and then he dies, and Juan Carlos disappoints him. He doesn't support the phalangist state, he, but he doesn't want to destroy it either. He um, uh, appoints a, a young guy, Suarez, who is, you know, uh, uh, who reaches out, as the saying goes, to uh, uh, Carrillo, who is the head of the Communist Party, who is a member of the elite, outsider elite. Not, he, as defined by the regime, he's an outsider. Um, and Carrillo and, and, and Suarez say, you know, let's not have another Spanish Civil War. That was a mistake. Let's just not do it. Let's have a, an elite bargain. Unlike the British kind of case, the evolution, insider evolution, it self-consciously bargained out with the others. Unlike the revolutionary model, there isn't a mass mobilization. It has a distinctive problem 
Um, uh, I'll get to the revolutionary problem in a minute. It's a distinct problem is we'll call it authenticity. So you see it in Spain, you know, where were the Basques in this elite construction? You know, where were the Catalans? Not anywhere. <laughs> the Spanish constitution is a, uh, uh, done by the elite so as to get into the European Union. So it has all the uh, lots of enlightenment features to it. It was uh, negotiated in, uh, par in, in mostly in secret and then presented to the voters in a as a fait accompli uh, in a referendum to dramatically simplify. Uh, 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 I'll be returning shortly to consider the distinctive authenticity problems posed by other uh, elite bargains, uh, 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 the distinctive ones having to do with elite bargains between indigenous elites and military occupiers, which occur in, for example, in the contemporary world, uh, places like, uh, um, uh, po well, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, and not too successful. But of course, when we go back, we should look at, and I, we will look at, um, post-war uh, uh, Japan and Germany, as well as look at the U uh, European Union as an elite insider-outsider construction. But first, I want to focus, go back to the revolutionary uh, paradigm. Uh, because one of the aims of my, uh, uh, this book, uh, um, is to see, to, to uh, take away the, uh, 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 the model of par the paradigmatic revolutionary state building that we inherited from the short 20th century, which is, of course, that the great, real, the real revolutions of the uh, 20th century were Lenin and Mao, and they were charismatic leaders, they built a, uh, institutions of energetic social movements, social uh, movement parties, hegemonic movement parties. Um, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, there were uh, cults of personality, is another way of talking about Charles de Gaulle as well as, as these people. Um, you know, charismatic leaders um, um, uh, who then, in Weberian terms, as you might have noticed, I'm an admirer of Weber, um, uh, the um, uh, uh, then uh, after their ener movement energy they win after their movement energy over time dissipates and they create a bureaucrat they try to create at least a centralized autocratic bureaucratic top down in Weberian terms rational bureaucratic state that's what how revolutions real revolutions occurred in the 20th century um, well I want to say let's begin with India though. Now, you know, you, one of, I do have, uh, well, uh, that's it for another time. Um, uh, what are the preconditions for democracy? You name it, India does not have it, right? Massive poverty. These efforts to, you know, link wealth with uh, de constitutional democracy. Massive poverty. Massive ignorance. Illiteracy, vast, vast illiteracy, right? No single language. Right? Um, uh, uh, a caste system of social relations. And yet, for 65 years, corruption. You know? And yet, for 65 years, this is the largest constitutional democracy in the world. How has this happened? Um, the, um, well, uh, it really is, you know, uh, uh, the, um, they have, of course, a hegemonic party, just like Lenin has and just like Mao has. It's the Congress Party of India, a hegemonic party, mobilized you know, by Gandhi and then by Nehru right? for generation. Uh, they don't have a, they don't, it's not military, partly because of the Gandhi thing. That's an interesting point to notice, right? but they are hegemonic. 
Okay. Um, but, and it's only because of this massive, mobilized, revolutionary outsiders, you know, Nehru and, and Gandhi were in jail. Um, uh, they were enemies of the system. Um, uh, the, um, uh, it's only because of the capacity that we can, let me throw in, so I'm, I think that we should take, respect the autonomy of the political, you see. The only way we can explain this really weird fact of India, that's why I don't like all these, you know, let's take 190 countries and each one a dot. Right? India is like a hell of a lot more important than Liechtenstein. Um, the, uh, uh, so what do we have? We have a movement party committed to enlightenment principles, especially under uh, Nehru, not so much Gandhi. Um, they then, at time two, take power, and they, uh, and this is, you know, half of my reputation is based on labels, uh, they constitutionalize their charisma. Um, uh, in the Constitution of 1950, the principal draftsman of the Constitution of 1950 is Ambedkar. What a story. He is the son of an untouchable who um, uh, uh, his father works for the uh, Indian army as some kind of flunky, I mean the British, in, you know, British the, the real British army, you know, as a flunky. Uh, his son uh, goes to uh, Western schools and of course, like me and many of you, does fabulously on examinations. Um, and uh, as a result, he uh, gets, you know, he goes, he goes to LSE, and then he gets a degree at Columbia in New York. Uh, I mean, we're talking, you know, in the 1915, 20, something like that. Um, he becomes a, a, a member of the bar uh, in, uh, 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 in Britain. Uh, uh, he comes back to uh, uh, India, and he turns down, fundamentally, a huge, cushy job as being one of the very few native advocates of great distinction to lead the untouchable movement. Could you imagine the impact of this symbol, putting aside the principles for the moment, of this untouchable writing the Constitution of India in a caste society? This shows you know, that, this, that he's expressing the things or, I mean, of course, it isn't only he. I mean, I'm, this, is, this is the coming attraction of, a, I'm afraid, a book or two. Uh, that I, I mean, this is getting too big for me, this, this project, but uh, this is coming attractions time. The, uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 you know, he is, with Nehru, et cetera, and so forth, expressing the principles that everybody was struggling for. That's time two. Time uh, three, uh, but of course, you see, during time two, when you, uh, the, the, the institutional entity that expresses the hopes of all of these millions of Indians who have mobilized, of course, tens and twenties and thirties of millions of didn't. <laughs> I don't want to give you the, um, uh, and have vindicated themselves. Um, the institution that expresses the successful revolution against the British is the Congress party, not the Constitution. What we see, though, over the course of time, in a way that I cannot describe here, two things that happen. One is the Congress party degenerates, as all parties, mov movement parties do, into a bunch of political hacks trying to get you form coalitions, the sort of thing that rational actor models of, um, uh, of politics try to express. Um, uh, and um, uh, meanwhile, the legal order gets more and more self-confident. You see, in the beginning, these Brits, these British-trained Indian lawyers, 
They don't know what this Constitution is about. How do you interpret the Constitution? Have the slightest clue. Over time, so we have these two arcs. One arc is the inevitable, this is the Weber in me, disintegration of this movement activism. The other arc is the increasing self-confidence of the legal caste and their success, in ways that I can't describe now, in, as the, the politicians become increasingly like hacks, the success in convincing the politicians and the world and the political system, in political participants in general, that's not the entire population of India by any means, that the constitution of uh, 1950 expresses the enduring achievement of the revolution, not the Congress party anymore. Same thing is going on uh, in South Africa. But I want to, because we, we, we happen to be in Europe, uh, uh, focus on uh, some uh, half-forgotten facts about Europe. Uh, because we see the same movement party dynamic at the birth of the Italian and French republics. In both cases, there is one very important difference. There is not one movement party. Uh, there are three who express the resistance to Hitler in both France and, in it and the fascists in Italy. Uh, the communists, the socialists, and the Christian Democrats in Italy, and the popular Republicans uh, who are a Christian party but not quite as the Christian Democratic variety in France. These three um, are uh, movement parties who come out of uh, the resistance struggles against Hitler, uh, repudiate the old regime, um, and elaborate a constitution expressing the anti-fascist principles. Um, uh, uh, that's the similarity of the Fourth Republic and the Italian Republic. In both cases, there are crucial mobilized referenda. There is a referendum on whether the Italian people will repudiate the king. Close vote, 53 to 47, yes. Um, uh, or should we become a republic? And if so, we will have a constituent assembly. This was all very self-consciously played out. People were, you know, really engaged in this. We have lots of data on this. I mean, normal people <laughs> knew what this was about. The same thing happens in France. Uh, the same three parties, communists, socialists, and Christian, uh, popular Republicans, Christian, uh, uh, they have, however, a new complexity in France. There's Charles de Gaulle, who is another outsider revolutionary from the outside, as opposed to the three parties or from the inside. They, uh, the, the three movement parties, propose a constitution. De Gaulle opposes it. The first round, he wins. The second round, the three movement parties win, and the Fourth Republic goes into operation, uh, and de Gaulle goes back to internal exile. Uh, then there's the 12 years of, we can talk about different views of how well the Fourth Republic did, uh, and then there's the Algerian crisis, and de Gaulle comes back as the revolutionary outsider once again, and this time does referenda, establishes the Fifth Republic, and we then once again see the same dynamic. The movement party behind de Gaulle um, you know, starts to disintegrate with Pompidou. Uh, uh, Giscard is not in the movement parties of allied. Um, the, uh, the arc of commitment uh, uh, declines. Um, there's a succession crisis and uh, an institution, the Conseil Constitutionnel, which was originally understood as simply a bulldog for 
de Gaulle, transforms itself into a constitutional legal institution. And they, within, and this is in a tradition, of course, the French have a, a deep tradition until this time of a, against the gouvernement de juge, against government by judges, and yet this dynamic of the movement party declining and the legal order getting increasingly self-confident, uh, 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 the first great decision occurs in 1971 uh, at the time of what I call the succession crisis, time three, which occurs in each of these scenarios that I'm painting out for you. Uh, and finally, it's only really in 2010 that in the, the role of the constitutional court is totally consolidated. Uh, um, so uh, one of my aims in this uh, uh, a book is to, to say, well, you know, we have this ideal type of revolutionary constitutionalism. Um, and then I have chapters on each thing and ask questions. Obviously, I can't do justice to the, the thick complexity of each of the the, the stories, but you know, a, ask questions like you know, how, why, how, how important is it th that when we have a hegemonic movement party, as in the case of India and um, uh, uh, South Africa, um, uh, compared to this trinitarian set of movement parties that break up uh, much more easily, et cetera, and so forth? That kind of question: How is De Gaulle like and unlike Mandela? <laughs> like and unlike Nehru. Uh, uh, um, well, uh, uh, the point of this book is to raise these questions, not to, you know, I mean, uh, that's what comp we need, a framework for comparative constitutional law, and that's what I'm trying to provide. Um, uh, the, um, okay, um, now let's contrast these revolutionary scenarios. Uh, to the very different uh, elite bargain path uh, uh, traveled by post-war Ger Germany and Japan, as well as uh, contemporary Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, here, in each of these cases, indigenous elites are uh, not only bargaining among each other, but they also have to bargain with the victorious military conqueror, the United States, or the Allies, whatever you want to call them over the terms of their political new beginnings. There is no hint in these, I mean, obviously, Afghan, we'll forget about Afghanistan and, and, uh, and, and uh, Iraq. These obviously have, uh, the constitutions that are, that are created have really deep authenticity problems, and as the Americans leave, it falls apart. End of story. Uh, the interesting thing is Germany and Japan. Um, Japan, if we look today, Japan has a, is now struggling with a serious authenticity problem. Um, uh, the uh, government of uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe is trying to repudiate the centerpiece of the, we'll call it the MacArthur Constitution, because it was in a dominant way imposed by the military, uh, MacArthur, on the Japanese elites, although the Japanese elites did have some bargaining power. Um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, so basically, Abe is trying to say that the peace constitution, peace article of the constitution, is fundamentally inconsistent with his narrative of Japanese history. But what isn't well known, although it's known to me, I have collaborators in Japan uh, who have translated or translating this, the uh, uh, Abe has a, uh, the party, the Liberal Democratic Party, which is neither liberal uh, nor democratic particularly, um, has a new draft of the entire constitution, which somehow or other they can't manage to translate into English. Uh, so my guys are trying to translate that, which is a total repudiation of the MacArthur Constitution of the fundamental principles. And this is not, I mean, what Abe is wanting to say is, this was imposed upon us, incompatible with Japanese values. We should have a constitution more like the Meiji constitution before, not totally, but more like, um, because that is 
expression of Japanese values. This is perfectly understandable. My point in this lecture and Weber's point is, you know, this is an effort, to, now that I'm in Germany, to marry Max Weber with uh, Diltai. I'm trying to f use the ideal types and verstehen, you know? I'm not trying to judge here. I'm trying to understand what the di constitutional dynamics of legitimation look like in the real world. Um, the question that we see with the obvious failures of authenticity in the, in the recent American disaster cases. See, they should have learned something from the success of Germany and Japan. The fundamental lesson is don't destroy the bureaucracy as your first act. Duh. That's what they did in, Ge in Iraq. Dopey. This is the state. This is talking about constitutionalism, right? You know, they destroyed the bureaucracy. They destroyed the army. Not smart. But in any event, they were much smarter in the post-war period. Um, and um, uh, they didn't destroy the Japanese bureaucracy. Um, and they actually, the entire MacArthur Constitution is passed as a constitutional amendment to the Meiji Constitution by the, bar the elites, and that's what gave the elites a little bargaining power. Because they... You know, they didn't have to do it. And, and MacArthur knew, no, it should be them who do it within their own constitutional processes. The real question, though, is uh, why don't we have an authenticity problem in Germany? That's the interesting question. Of course, the uh, process of writing the uh, Grundgesetz is not uh, as the Americans are and the Allies are not as obtrusive, but they are pretty obtrusive. Um, uh, the, um, uh, first, of course, they, they create the lender governments, uh, which, which are, and they only approve three parties to uh, run for the lender governments. Uh, um, uh, and then they issue something called the London Protocol, which imposes conditions on the lender governments, lender prime ministers or premiers or whatever they're called, uh, uh, when they go to the Parlementaire Schisrat. I want to emphasize two conditions. The first is that the Parliamentarische Rat write a Verfassung. Nope. We're not going to do it. We're going to write a Grundgesetz. Because, um, and in the Schluss article of the Grundgesetz, it says a Verfassung is going to be written in when the East comes in, because we're gonna, we, we refuse to legitimate the imminent division of Germany into two, the DDR and the Federal Republic. This is a provisional document. That's what the Schluss article says. And second, so they disobey that. And second, very clearly, the London Protocols say the Verfassung, or if you insist, the uh, Grundgesetz, has to be approved in a referendum by the voters. And they refuse to do that. Partly because they're going to lose in Bavaria, or so they fear. Partly because the Hitler had degraded the whole idea of folks' uh, referendum. Uh, 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 partly, uh, this is the difference between Stunde Null and a revolutionary scenario, my friend. Uh, uh, I'm going to, uh, um, uh, uh, there's a, a Don Commerce, who is the, really the leading uh, American uh, senior scholar on German constitutional law, and a fine person. I'm going to, uh, he's writing a new book, I recommend it to you when, he, when it comes out. Uh, I want to, I'll just uh, quote a, a passage here. Opinion polls showed that most West Germans had little interest in the proceedings of the Parliamentary Council. Only one in five Germans in the American zone expressed a serious interest in the Council's debates. A majority of the respondents were not even aware of the Parliamentary Council's existence. A majority. In May of 49, a survey found that two-thirds of them were not sure, in May of 49, we're not sure what the basic law was. 
After all, he says, West German voters were denied the chance to approve uh, the Constitution, depriving them uh, of the knowledge they might have gained about its content had a popular campaign for ratification taken place. You see, at the same time, in France and Germany, in France and Italy, which were also devastated by the war. Of course, Germany worse than France and Italy, but they were all devastated. Right? People knew what was going on. <laughs> because the revolution, because of this mobilization business, and there, you know, uh, uh, in Germany, this is an elite construction, um, and, uh, uh, and, that, and, uh, and so, um, uh, 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 within this context, uh, the Grund some of the greatest formula of the Grundgesetz sound, if you will permit a German word, komisch. What does it mean for an ostentatiously provisional Grundgesetz to proclaim the eternal value of human dignity? What does it mean for the basic law to proclaim democracy to be an eternal value when its drafters refuse to submit it to a vote? The authenticity problem arose once again in 1989, with East German demonstrators chanting, Wir sind das Volk. The vice president of the uh, West German Constitutional Court, Ernst Wolfgang Birkenfurter, a great man, a great thinker, I, I mean, a lovely person too, but a really, he's, I, I really admire him as a, uh, uh, a rare thinker and, ju and judge. You know, there are some people who are thinkers, there are some people who are judges, but not too many get it together. Um, raised this basic authenticity issue in a pamphlet of 60 pages that he wrote, and it was very much discussed at the time. Um, pointing to the final article, uh, Birkenfurter uh, insisted that now was the time for the government to convene a constituent assembly. That's what the article says, when the whole German people can participate. Helmut Kohl was not amused. The last thing he wanted was a lot of East German communists and West German leftists entering a constituent assembly to challenge the legitimacy of his government. Instead, he engineered reunification by means of a very odd treaty, which extinguished the existence of one of its signatories, the DDR, at the moment it signed it. Now, treaties, you know, have to do with sovereign states that organize their future relationships. This one, I no longer exist. That's the treaty. Moreover, this treaty trumps the Verfassung, I mean, the, the, the Grundgesetz. It says things like, um, East German women can have a free abortion for a year. This is totally inconsistent with the jurisprudence of the, you know, Bundesverfassungsgericht. Totally at the time. Uh, a, a student of mine uh, who just got a, a, a really, I, I hope, Maybe, I mean, maybe we should, he, he just got a, a doctorate in law under my supervision, it happens. Uh, 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 Stefan Yagi uh, uh, has written a great dissertation, doctoral dissertation, on this fascinating period. You know, there are round tables. I mean, there are a lot of things going on, um, uh, which it's, unfor unfortunately, it's in English. I want to, I want to, encourage him to translate into German, but in any event, uh, it really, sh you should re look at it. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, but the, for now, uh, the uh, key point uh, is um, that all of this is forgotten. You know, this is not very ancient history, but uh, somehow nobody, you know, runs around wondering about the authenticity of the Grundgesetz in the way that Abe is mobilizing against the authenticity of the comparable, I mean, of course, when I say comparable, I mean comparative law, you know, obviously there are a million differences, but nonetheless, and the point of this 
talk is to suggest how these three pathways actually make comparisons of certain cases to others seem compelling, you know, which are not compelling in the normal ways of area studies or liberal democratic uh, um, uh, 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 developments or transitions or something like that. And that's, after all, its contribution, if there is one. Okay, so my question again is how? Uh, why did this act of collective amnesia, how has it been so successful in Germany? Of course, it, I'm not trying to suggest that nobody remembers these events, but they are not, you know, what people think of when they think of the uh, Gunkersetz. <laughs> um, um, I'll defer any answer to, to any effort to answer this question uh, uh, right now uh, uh, for the discussion period, right, uh, if it comes up. Right now, I'm going to conclude um, uh, 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 by standing back and suggest the way my brief discussions of Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and Britain add up to a special dilemma for the European Union. There's an ongoing uh, di disagreement uh, uh, about the nature of the Union. Some scholars uh, uh, think that it is broadly comparable to other great federations in world history, and in particular the United States. Uh, but others view the Union as unique or sui generis. Uh, they think that comparisons with the United States and other federalisms are really basically misleading, not enlightening. Uh, uh, the discussion that uh, my presentation suggests that I'm a, 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 I've been pushed into the uniqueness camp but for a unique reason, which is this. The leading nations of Europe come to the Union along different constitutional paths. Germany and Spain emerge from elite constitutional bargains. France and Italy from revolutionary breakthroughs by resistance outsiders. And Britain from the evolutionary adaptations of an entrenched establishment. Little wonder, then, that politicians in these countries, and the general public as well, disagree about the right way to go forward in the constitutional development of Europe, because they have different paradigms in mind. And the point of this book is to elaborate these paradigms in a way that makes them more self-conscious. But I, uh, 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 the French and Italians are open to revolutionary appeals to the people of Europe. Uh, as was attempt, uh, attempted by Giscard, notice the French name, uh, at the Brussels Convention, which was the great effort to solve the de democracy deficit <laughs> through referenda. Imagine that the first referenda had been held in Germany uh, rather than France. And imagine that the Germans, for all sorts of reasons, voted ja. Uh, this was, after all, 2003, not... Um, and imagine, then, that that changed the nature of the debate in France, uh, and the French voted we oui by 54%. I wouldn't, I'm not saying that the Germans with... I'm not a Rousseauian, you know, volonté générale. I'm, uh, I, you know, 54%. Uh, and imagine this led to a very dynamic dialogue uh, which led to the, basically, the uh, valorization through the model of popular revolutionary constitutionalism to the uh, uh, constitutional treaty. Of course, it's unthinkable that Germany would have had a referendum. It's even doubtful that it was constitutional to have a referendum. Very thinkable for the French to have a referendum. <laughs> That's what they've been doing for a long time. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, um, so, uh, 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 but imagine that the Germans had done that, uh, and then we had had the economic crisis. Um, I think that uh, the European Union would have come into this crisis with a much deeper reserve of democratic legitimacy, constitutional legitimacy, than the kind of aftermath. The, Linden, the Lisbon uh, Treaty, of course, is a, a, a minor variation on the theme of the Brussels Convention's constitutional treaty. It's just the name, they say. <laughs> but it isn't just the name. It's the pathway 
They failed on the revolutionary pathway. Well, let's muddle through, says the Brits. Yes, let's have a technocratic solution or two. Let's use the Deutsche Bank. I mean, the, you know, let's have a Bundesbank, you know. Let's do technocracy. Well, that's where we are today. Technocracy on the Euro level and populist nationalist mobilizations on the uh, national level. Bad idea. Okay. Um, uh, is there a way out of this impasse? Uh, that's uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, question for you uh, to think of. Um, the, uh, 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 as is all too apparent uh, uh, from my talk, uh, this is a new project for me. In fact, this is the first time I've had the guts to sketch it out in public. Uh, 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 as frankly, it's turned out uh, a bit more ambitious than I had anticipated. Uh, a year ago uh, when I finished writing volume three. Uh, 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 um, so I especially look forward to hearing uh, your uh, reactions since they're the first time I've ever heard uh, reactions in public and I, will, I promise that I will, will not be uh, annoyed at you for saying it's a piece of junk. Um, but for those who don't get a chance to say that or uh, something else, uh, uh, be, please uh, feel free to email me at uh, bruce.ackerman at yale.edu. I uh, very much need your help. Thank you. <laughs> Sit down. Doesn't matter. I need a glass. <clears throat> Thank, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Bruce, for your exciting, thought-provoking uh, presentation. And now you have a chance to hear the first two critical comments. And Michael Hutter will be the first one who is going to comment on your talk. I'm sorry for giving me such a little notice. It's a hard act to follow, to say the least. And uh, although you call for help, I do hesitate to come to your rescue. Um, after all, we're talking about constitutional law, which is sort of the champions league of legal science. Uh, why? Because the constitution reigns supreme. And those who are concerned with whatever the supreme is are a tad above the others. So to get a handle on the situation, not being a legal scholar myself, I reframed the object and uh, figured actually constitutions are a major case of social innovation. Uh, social innovation in the sense that uh, they are a collaborative effort. It takes a lot of people over a long time to even come up with the concept and put it into reality. And it's social also on the receiving side, on the impact side, because it changes social interaction uh, and people deal with each other differently than under other kinds of regimes. So uh, look, let's look back at the 18th century when the whole thing came up after a certain incubation period. First constitution was written in 1755 in Corsica. Then soon later, in 1776, came the United States of America. In Europe, most attempts failed in 1848, and France accomplished one in 1870. Germany had to wait till 1918. And if you look at, the, at Great Britain, which doesn't have a constitution up to now, I discovered that since 2009, they do have a Supreme Court. So finally, they're getting around. Now, according to Bruce Ackerman, uh, all these cases follow a pattern of establishment that starts with charismatic movement. And here I have a, some doubts about the way you use the term charisma. Um, you note that there are four Weberian modes of getting to power, and you would like to add a fifth one, constitutionalism. But then it is charismatic movement, which somehow uh, drives constitutionalism. So I'm not quite clear on your notion of charisma and the relation between charisma and constitutionalism. Anyway, the charismatic movement leads to a new founding until the point when the Supreme Court confidently elaborates constitutional law. That's 
uh, time four, that's when things run smoothly. The uh, innovation has been accomplished in a particular kind of world of worth, namely the world of the law. And then it can serve as sort of a legitimizing foundation for political interaction, among other things. And the political system, in turn, can influence legal positions depending on the nation, in the US more so than in Germany, for instance. So the law, the constitution, constraints. And today, there are hundreds of such constitutions in force around the globe. And they, as a, as a whole, constitute a truly evolutionary field. Over these 200 years, there have been all sorts of different developments. Some went down, some came up, and most of them were changed. And this entire field, Bruce Ackerman declares to be his research laboratory. Now, uh, he usually plays big. In We the People, which is a three-volume book, he has investigated the history of the US Constitution. And he has argued that the basic innovation from 1776 needed a series of new inventions to remain viable. He calls these transformations revolutionary because, and I quote, Spokesmen for regime outsiders have organized mass followings and then have managed to constitutionalize their, here comes again, charismatic politics. In this book, the one that's uh, in gestation, he moves on to the even more ambitious task of comparing episodes of innovative change between all the constitutions that have emerged. At least his time frame, though, is somewhat limited. He looks only at cases from about the 1930s to today. Now, as I know from the book manuscript, which exists in parts, he employs two basic analytical tools. One is to look beyond institutional structure, as many others have done, and to pay attention to professional culture in the respective cases. And naturally, I would have loved to discuss that part, but it's too early yet, the manuscript hasn't progressed to the stage when the professional cultures appear. But the prime tool for the first round is this distinction of three ideal types of social action. In differing ways, they lead to the successful formulation of a constitutional paradigm and its institutional installation. Now let's look at them a bit more in detail. Number one is revolutionary constitutionalism. And that's a term that Ackerman stretches very far. It reaches from self-conscious mass mobilization against the existing structure of authority to the activity of a radical president who puts right-wing ideologues on the Supreme Court. It also includes, as we just heard, the case of, say, France, where you have three charismatic movements uh, side by side, plus a fourth one in the person of de Gaulle in the background, and they all somehow make up the revolutionary force. So all this, the, the single movement party and four forces are all within the same ideal type. Number two is a mode of action where an entrenched elite changes the existing legal framework through step-by-step -step reform. Now, to call this type insider evolution is somewhat misleading because it makes purposeful action appear as environmental selection, which it certainly isn't. Now, I agree and I think it's a great thing that Ackermann's entire project deals with an evolutionary process, but the term doesn't fit only that one mode that favors stepwise reform and avoids passionate irrationality. Number three is a type of coalition building. He calls it a self-conscious bargain between established leaders, insiders, and elite outsiders. I doubt the bargaining character because the process happens in a very complex situation of cultural and political maneuvering. Take only the German case, which Ackermann has sketched so clearly. The term Verfassung was avoided 
with reference to an abstract unity of regions that belonged to a state less than 100 years old, founded in 1870. And the referendum was considered too risky because of its recent devalorization by the previous authoritarian regime. By the way, authoritarian regimes do not play a great role in this book yet. But all these considerations to cultural precedent, to history, they are all grouped under bargaining. And the case gets even worse when you look at Japan where you run into a thousand-year-old history that pretends to agree with the outside um, forces and then develops an authenticity problem on top of that. So the three types appear to overlap. And even if one could agree about correct attributions of real cases, they still do point to differences in the ways in which constitutional orders came about and the forms which they took as paradigms, as institutions, and as professional cultures. And along these components, Ackermann is indeed able to construct his narratives. He does do that for an astounding series of cases, from India to Iraq, from Italy to Afghanistan. And Ackermann also suggests a narrative for the EU's constitutional development. To say that it is a development sui generis clearly means that a further innovation is needed to come up with a constitutional order that surpasses the multitude of existing, and I quote, constitutional cultures. Cultures. There it is again, the weasel word, culture. I've been chasing it for the past seven years myself. I hope Bruce that you will find a way to use that term consciously and effectively in explaining how constitutional law succeeds in renewing itself. Thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Michael. We will have immediately the second one, and so you have some time to reflect the harsh criticism, and uh, I'm sure uh, Reid will add something as well. Uh, thanks a lot, Bruce, for a, a very ins inspiring talk, and I'm, 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 I'm sure it is going to be a, a marvelous book. Uh, but as you say, you're, you're still at, at the beginning, and I think you know there are, are a few. I mean, it raises a lot of questions. Some of the questions I had after reading your stuff, then other questions that came hearing you talk, and one can one one notices that you're in, in a thinking process yourself still. So I hope we can make some uh, some small contributions to that process. So let me start with um, your point of departure. Constitution, con constitutionalism, uh, you say, is a fundamental way in which power justifies itself. Um, and it's basically the idea that law constrains top decision, decision makers. And you, make, you made a point of it to emphasize that constitutionalism is not the same as liberal democracy, and it's also not the same as uh, the rule of law. Um, the latter point uh, you make in, in the written version I've seen uh, with reference to enlightened despots, for instance, where you say, well, there's a rule of law there, but certainly not liberal um, democracy. I wonder whether one can say that there is rule of law in a system where the rule of law doesn't apply to the ruler, but because basically that's what enlightened despotism is. You can say, okay, in these systems there was rule of law for everyone else than the despot, but the, you know, the, the, um, but that's that's an aside. So, and liberal liberal democracy. You pointed briefly to the case of uh, of Iran as an example of what then I guess in your view is a constitutionalist regime, but also certainly not a, a liberal uh, democracy. And what I think you should do more than you've done so far is actually make this point much clearer that you're not talking about just dem democratization and the imposition of the rule of law, because that would not be as original as the claim that you want to make, and it would also force you much more to engage with uh, the huge literature on transitions to democracy, etc., uh, than you do at present. So if you want to make the case that constitutionalism is something different, you should not pick 
or at least not focus so much on the cases that you focused on now, which are all constitutionalist, real liberal democracies under the rule of law, where it's impossible to make that distinction. So then I would challenge you to indeed take the case of Iran, or for my part, the Soviet Union, or Mexico, or whatever, or current Russia. I mean, there are all these countries that do have constitutions. Are they constitutional regimes or not? But then why not? I mean, th that's where you have to make the demarcation, I think, much clearer and pick critical cases where you can say, well, there we have uh, a case that is a case of constitutionalism, but clearly not a liberal democracy or clearly not rule of law or whatever. So, and there's also a second case of countries that then becomes uh, interesting. You briefly referred to the UK and said, well, you know, it's ridiculous when people say that that's not a constitutionalist regime, but there are two, um, that's, that's one of these cases, because there we don't have a written constitution. Now, you may have an argument that it's still constitutionalist, but that would have to be made clearer. And there are also those countries that do have constitutions, but constitutions that are actually not enforced by courts, such as my uh, country of origin, the Netherlands. We do have a constitution, but courts are forbidden by constitution uh, to actually uh, um, um, constrain lawmakers, eh? that's your de definition. It's con constraining, well, it's a sort of self-constraint then, but you know, it's not the courts who do the constraining, uh, for sure. Um, and then, yeah, my next point is, is about the classification you make. So there's this uh, revolutionary outsider scenario, there's the evolutionary insider one, and then there is the sort of bargaining between uh, insider and outsider elites. And um, there is certainly something to be said for that classification, but there is maybe also something to be said for another classification, and I would like you to react to that, because I was a little bit <coughs> surprised to find Spain and South Africa in different categories. Although I think they are, they have many similarities because they're basically a negotiated settlement between, you know, a, a standing elite and, and and challenging outsiders. The difference is that the outsiders were mobilized in the case of South Africa, and they were repressed. Although they were, of course, also not completely repressed. There was quite a bit of uh, guerrilla activity and, and bomb attacks, etc., and assassinations going on in the last years of Franco. So it wasn't that there was no opposition whatsoever. So another way of class classifying these regimes would be to say, well, we have cases where we have constitutions that are unilaterally, unilaterally imposed by revolutionary movements. Um, that would be, uh, for instance, uh, the, the Indian case. Um, and then we have cases of negotiated settlement, and that would then include both South Africa and Spain. And then we might also have the case of that would be largely the same as your uh, um, evolutionary insider one, which is basically a preemptive move by insiders who do see, uh, of course, an outside challenge, but before it becomes danger as dangerous uh, to actually become a, a revolutionary threat, they make reforms to sort of uh, prevent that. And I think, to me, that that classification makes more sense because the aim of the Constitution is, I think, a, a different one in the sort of a unilateral imposition scenario, because there the, what the Constitution is supposed to do is basically to enshrine the revolutionary principles. And I think that would also allow you then to bring on board sort of Iran or Mexico or whatever, the non-liberal cases. That's also the Indian case. Whereas in the negotiated settlement, both in the, in the Spanish and also in the South African case, the aim of the Constitution is much more to provide guarantees for the old insiders that the terms of the negotiation will also be honored after power has been handed over to those who will be then in the majority. That's a very different kind of type of constitution that you get through such a negotiation than through unilateral imposition. So I think that classification maybe leads to stronger predictions of differences in, uh, in constitutions than, than your classification. And then I think my final point is about Germany. Um, and that, then I go back to your definition of, uh, uh, of constitutionalism or the idea of constitutionalism as being about law constraining top decision makers. Well, if we're talking about the Grundgesetz or the Verfassung, 
the aim was not so much to constrain top decision makers as to constrain uh, the people. You've, you've emphasized it yourself. That's why uh, a referendum is unthinkable in, in, in the German case. So top decision makers also includes, um, in, in a democracy at least, it in includes also the threats that uh, electorates through referendums or also through elections um, use their power as top decision makers to, uh, to impose non-liberal um, uh, uh, laws. So it's not always about sort of constraining elites, but it's also about constraining uh, the people. And in that sense, the Constitution is not just about we the people, sometimes also against the people. So you will have a chance to Frankish. respond, yes. This is great. Um, the, um, and of course, I would have to think about this. <laughs> but I'll talk anyway, but don't, don't take this too seriously, you know. Uh, the um, uh, first, uh, in, uh, really I'm uh, basically uh, not trying to add to Weber. I'm trying to displace him. Um, I'm trying, he's inspiring me, but that doesn't mean I'm like adding a couple of boxes. Um, the, um, uh, so you're absolutely right that what I'm doing is using his concept of charisma, but we'll have to talk about what that means because I don't think he's very clear about what it means. And, uh, and I think one of the challenges, which I have not nearly fulfilled in this draft, I haven't been clear enough about what it means, uh, but I'll give a stab. Uh, uh, um, the um, uh, 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 the uh, so I, I do want to say well you know if uh, Weber were alive today uh, he'd be Bruce Ackerman looking around asking what are the modes of legitimation that actually are going on in the world one of the key ones is constitutionalism another one is democracy which analytically in my mind, as you're well aware, and you were just making the point, sometimes constitutionalism tries to constrain the people. That's what elitist constitutionalism might well do. Um, the, uh, so they are two different modes of legitimation. Another uh, mode of legitimation today is science, knowledge. You know, um, so, you know, when these people say, you know, the earth uh, isn't warming, you know, they might be democratic, it might be constitutional to pass a statute uh, declaring that uh, uh, the earth isn't warming, and therefore we should abolish the Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, who knows what the Republicans are going to do next time. Um, it still would be illegitimate from this other very dominant mode of legitimation in the world today. So uh, while traditional legitimation, not so much. Natural law, you see, the Weberian temptation is to look upon constitutionalism as a form of natural law. Uh, and that's the fourth one. Weber doesn't think much of it, but, uh, you know, sphere um, rationalität. Uh, no, I want to say there's something more. So, so I'm not disturbed by the fact that I'm using some Weberian ideas to reconstruct in the spirit of Weber, you know, things of the world's legitimating rhetorics have changed since uh, uh, Max was walking around. Um, so that's the first thought. Um, the um, uh, second, I think you're absolutely right also that evolution and, um, may, and bargaining don't really, aren't the right words. And, and actually these labels matter some. Um, uh, perhaps we could call it um, um, the British mode uh, uh, or this insider pragmatism. You know, what is the problem you people are screaming and yelling about? Oh, you're screaming and yelling about something I've discovered. We'll give you something. <coughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, that's better than evolution for the reasons that you're suggesting and uh, similarly bargaining doesn't do it. I think you're right. I mean, how about self-conscious construction? B 
between elites. And here, though, we go to your question. Um, see, what are the things that I'm rebelling against? I don't like to write books uh, <coughs> in the German style reviewing literature. I can't stand it. <laughs> the, you know, when these Germans or continentals in general come and they're, they, uh, they come to write dissertations on their head, Dr. Professor Ackerman, you know, the great man, blah, blah, blah. And um, uh, they uh, think they're going to impress me by giving me a review of the literature of 200, of 200 pages of stuff. And, I, and they do it without, you know, they have great. I say, what's your idea? I, you know, I'm an idea person, but who are my enemies is also, you know, one of them is the rational actor school. Bargaining. That's why I, don't, I think you're right about the bargaining word. You know, we have, everybody has assets. This is like the market, right? Everybody has dollars. That's the, and then they bargain to an optimal conclusion and maybe courts are modes of policing the bargain. And that's uh, true some of the time, especially in elite constructions. Uh, elite constructions, notice. <laughs> the, um, but um, uh, that isn't really doing, uh, this market metaphor isn't doing justice to a deep commitment of mine and Max Weber's, it should be said, the autonomy of the political. And here it matters a lot whether um, the, there is this mobilized hundreds, millions of people who the leadership is responsible to because they shared, you know, why is, you know, what, 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 did, what, what did Nelson Mandela do at this time before he was sent to jail for 25 years? <laughs> you know? um, he was, from 1953, dealing with all these people. <laughs> who were making demands on him, large numbers of them, in a way that Conrad Adenauer was not. In, in 19, when he was at the Parlamental Schrat, uh, he wasn't do, doing that. Everyone was, you know, this was Stunde Null. Uh, it was a very different sort of thing. Uh, and from the structure of the political, um, uh, I, I think that I'm trying to emphasize that I also have history on my side in the following trivial, but not trivial sense. That is, the idea of the modern constitution uh, does arise, you know, from the French and American uh, uh, and Latin American constitution. Some of, you know, the Jacobin constitution, I don't know whether you want to call that liberal or not, <laughs> but they certainly had a constitution. Um, so, uh, so that's why I'm... Uh, um, uh, 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 more uh, uh, talking about a legitimacy. The characteristic form of the rational actor model is they don't ask the question of legitimacy. Huh? You know, having a government is sort of like buying uh, potato chips. What are your preferences? How can they be aggregated? No. For me, and here I'm... Uh, I, one of my most amusing, I do read the German reviews of my books, which are generally negative. Um, the, um, uh, but one of the best ones was, uh, I wrote a book, which I actually am proud of to this day, called Social Justice in the Liberal State. And uh, this fellow archly said, Ackerman is an English-speaking Habermasian, by which he meant that I was clear and uh, uh, more... Uh, 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 model buildinger than, uh, than Habermas was, but, uh, and therefore superficial. Um, but um, the, uh, uh, so I have, uh, uh, but I do believe that uh, with Habermas, that legitimation is the con central concept that I'm looking at constitutions to see how they solve it, not how they aggregate preferences. And that's why I'm not, I'm saying that there is a fundamental difference, but uh, in the logic of legitimation between the Spanish and the, and the South African cases. Um, but of course, this is an, not, it's, it's an interpretive question. One has to look at the materials and see the logics of legitimation that are transparent. Now, 
I also, one of the things I'm not trying to do, uh, because I, w are we gonna have questions from the floor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh good. Uh, the, uh, uh, one of the other things I'm tr not trying to do is predict. Legitimation, the, the internal point of view of the actors that a regime is legitimate or not, or sort of yes or sort of no, because of course uh, uh, there's a degree kind of thing rather than yes it's legitimate or no it's illegitimate, is only one causal factor. Um, among many other causal factors which account for whether a regime succeeds in governing for 50 years or not. We could have a non-constitutional regime. I mean, after all, the Soviet Union lived for how many years? 80? Um, 70? Something like that? Um, uh, that's a long time. Um, that's stable. Especially, you know, they, they, there are millions of people die and all, all, the, all the things that the Soviet Union, uh, it wasn't, however, at uh, uh, any time a constitutional state in the sense that the piece of paper, Stalin's constitution, lovely document of 1935, actually constrained behavior. Okay. Um, the last uh, point I want to also, I mean, I, I, I'm very sympathetic to thinking that I don't have the words, the, the conceptions quite right. I, I resist, of course, the, the thought that these ideal types conceptually merge into one another, because that's the whole point. The ideal type should be quite distinct. Of course, some historic, that's why they're ideal types. A history can com, of a particular political history will contain different elements of different ideal types. I'm not committed to the idea that uh, uh, the French only have a revolutionary legitimation. Uh, I am committed to the idea that they have a revolutionary legitimation which is absent from the vocabulary of German constitutional self-understanding at the present time, that kind of thing. The, um, uh, the final thought is um, courts and could, um, maybe, uh, and this brings in your uh, uh, thought, uh, 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 about uh, one of the many parts of this uh, edifice I haven't really developed. Rather than saying um, uh, courts constraining politics, uh, I would say something like this at the end. Um, constitutionalism is a form of narrative construction of self-understanding of the legitimate sources of authority. It has to do with history, you see. That is to say, why is this pathetic uh, 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 president of France a legitimate president? You know, polls like 11% or something like that. Well, it has to do with Charles de Gaulle. <laughs> However embarrassing right? the comparison might be. Um, uh, the, he tells, you, have, you tell a story that the Fifth Republic isn't illegitimate yet. <laughs> Um, the, um, uh, so I would say that uh, even without courts, we could have constitutionalism with an entrenched professional narrative. And that's the point that you were saying before that I haven't developed among the many others. Uh, this notion of a profession that is, whose internal recognition is sufficiently powerful as to constrain political actors. Um, and that's what I should be aiming for on the, you know, the way I write, um, embarrassingly, is um, I, write, I write four hours a day. Let me, I mean, I hold myself up as a role model between nine and one. I don't answer the phone. I try not to answer email. I just write from nine to one, and I have lunch uh, with uh, some friends or whatever, and then I just talk to anybody who walks into my office for the rest of the day. Um, the, uh, and I do it about 340 days a year. <laughs> The, uh, and I do not have outlines, as is painfully apparent. I just write a first draft, and I throw it away, I write a second draft, and they, I publish it when it's, I get tired. Um, but um, uh, but I, think, I thank you very much, uh, because I, I, we're, I mean, we're, uh, I'm, you'll see the influence of this conversation. <clears throat> May I add, add one question before I completely lose my voice? Uh, it is not clear to me what makes a constitution democratic. Is it a set of normative rules, of core principles, 
which has to be written down in the Constitution, or is it a sequence of procedural steps to legitimate the drafting and passing of the Constitution, or is it the day-to-day -day acceptance of the demos, the people, what Jürgen Habermas and Dolf Sternberger have uh, coined as Verfassungspatriotismus. And if there is a lack of one, can it be compensated by the other one? Because you mentioned the French Fourth Republic. They probably had the most formidable democratic sequence of steps to drafting and passing the Constitution. And it was the most instable constitution we have seen in post-war Europe. It collapsed already in 58. Well, what, you see, I've done several things in my all too long career. <laughs> the, uh, I began with uh, the idea of, uh, is liberalism um, uh, a coherent philosophy? Especially activist lib liberalism, rather than classical 19th century liberalism. And that's what the, uh, the uh, Social Justice in the Liberal State book, uh, which took me 10 years after all to write, uh, was about. Um, this is not that. This is an effort, let's go back to Diltai, of Verstehen, the internal, or let's talk heart, HLA heart, participants in a political regime have an internal point of view an orientation to what counts as a legitimate exercise of power. I am, it is a world historical innovation that something called constitutionalism enters into this internal point of view in a, a many, but not all, uh, systems of power called uh, in the world. Can we gain a purchase on their internal logics of legitimation? The, uh, so, as you are suggesting, for example, the idea of a revolutionary constitutionalism which tries to bar access to the people, meaning future mass mobilizations, future efforts, to, is deeply internally uh, contradictory. The idea of an elite construction, rather than bargain, that says, you know, we in Germany have, uh, you know, this is, this is the conversation I had with uh, Ziedler. You know, if you read, uh, if you listen to Adolf Hitler's speeches, Goebbels' speeches, unsere Revolution. <laughs> Every, you know, they're talking all the time, revolution. Revolution doesn't sell in Germany. <laughs> uh, not yet, not for a long time still. Um, and to look upon the people as the mo populism. I wrote an article once uh, 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 contrasting the word, the use of the word populism in America, which is a good term, pro-term in America, to be populist. And Germany, Populismus was about as bad a thing as you can say of a group. Um, so, depending on the path, uh, say I, uh, to this constitutionalist idea generated f from the American, French, and Latin American revolutions, but then have suffered so many fates, uh, uh, and they have been appropriated and reappropriated, uh, uh, so that in uh, so the idea of constitutionalism is now in, you know, um, uh, divorced in, uh, in elitist constitutions, oftentimes from populism. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, German uh, uh, Grundgesetz uh, uh, begins, uh, what is it in German? Uh, uh, it says, uh, it uses the uh, distinction, uh, uh, the CS distinction between uh, constituent power, uh, what, what is it, Verfassungsgebende Gewalt, uh, is what it says in the uh, first, um, uh, in the, pro in the pro preamble. This is a legal fiction. But a legal fiction in a different sense from in France, you see. They actually believe it. 
<laughs> they believe that CS distinction between pouvoir constituant and constitué, that's really fundamental and that the constituant is the foundation. This was a metaphor <laughs> in Germany. A sort of scholarly, oh yeah, this is, you know, Verfassungsgebende Gewalt, except it's called by uh, the Grundgesetz. Good evening and welcome to the last lecture of the Distinguished Lecture Series at the WZB. We heard during the year a lecture by economists, by sociologists, by a political scientist, and finally we have a, can I call you Bruce, a constitutionalist who is a lawyer by training, uh, but from time to time, he cannot refrain to dive into the lowlands of politics. So he talks and writes about politics as well. At present, Bruce has the eminent privilege to be here as a spouse, to be here as a spouse of Susan Rose Ackerman, who is a fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg here in Berlin, I think this is one of the best positions one can have. Maybe even better than the position you normally have in your normal life as a Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University since 1987. Before, he was among others a law clerk to a judge Henry J. Friendly at the U.S. Court of Appeals, the next year a Lord uh, Clark to the Justice John Harlan at the U.S. Supreme Court. But then he left uh, the real world of courts, writing about them, became an assistant professor of law at the University of Pens Pennsylvania at the law school. Later, he took on a position of law and public policy analysis at the University of Pennsylvania as well. And finally, in 1974, he became a professor of law at Yale University. Don't be afraid, not only because I'm anyway uh, threatened to lose my voice if I talk longer than five minutes, uh, don't be afraid that I will present all the publications of Bruce Ackerman here, 18 books translated in different languages, and his opus magnum is on We the People. Uh, the third volume just appeared, The Civil Rights Revolution, uh, and we are uh, curious about to know how many volumes we still have to expect. But he also wrote about uh, topics like the decline and fall of the American Republic. It's very interesting to hear, Bruce, that there is already, has already been a fall of the American Republic, or before the next attack at Yale University Press, the failure of founding fathers, and for political scientists, a quite interesting and innovative book on Deliberation Day, meaning there should be a national holiday where the people deliberate about the different merits of the candidates running for uh, membership in the parliament. Most recently, he also uh, wrote a short uh, but extremely interesting article on reviving democratic citizenship. And he argues in this article that we need an ambitious reform of uh, the revival of democratic life. And he proposes four factors. I've just named these factors a campaign finance initiative granting each voter 50 Patriot dollars to fund candidates and political parties of his or her choice. The second proposal is this national holiday, a deliberation day. The third one, a system of federally financed electronic news vouchers 
to permit professional journalism to survive the destruction of its traditional business model. And last but not least, a new form of citizenship inheritance, which provides, please listen, which provides $80,000 to all Americans as they start off life uh, as adults. This obviously has something to do with an equality of life chances as well. But Bruce Ackerman, I think, is good. Um, uh, uh, not at all. Uh, it's the idea that law, in one way or another, constrains top decision makers. I'll begin by sketching three paths to constitutionalism, which serve as the foundation for my ideal types. The first path starts with the birth of modern understandings, as they emerged during the American, French, and Latin American revolutions of the 18th century. Over the course of the next two centuries, the idea of revolutionary constitutionalism has swept the world. Under this scenario, a mobilized movement of revolutionary outsiders defined by the system as outsiders, um, co actually wins and uses the Constitution. Of course, most of the time they get crushed. But they sometimes win. And they use the Constitution to elaborate the principles that motivated them in time one we'll call the mobilization phase, the mass mobilization phase time one, and the founding phase is at time two. Right? Um, and these constitutions contain principles and institutions which constrain authority. They don't have to be liberal principles. There are liberal revolutionary constitutions and anti-enlightenment constitutions. The, uh, uh, fundamental constitution of the uh, uh, Islamic Republic of Iran was written in Paris by uh, a, a professor at the Sorbonne. Um, and then was changed a good deal, but nonetheless is uh, demonstrably at work today in Iran. Um, the, um, uh, since the uh, revolutionary mobilization challenges the regime, uh, it often uh, gains power through violence, as in the case of the United States, the American, you know, George Washington. Who is George Washington? He is the shaker of our, he's the, he's the first guerrilla leader who actually wins. That's all he is. He's, you know, he loses all the cities during the, civil, during the American Revolution. He's in a place called Valley Forge with a very small number of people. What is Valley Forge? Not any of the big cities. He's lost them, and he then makes little attacks. The, uh, 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 similarly, uh, in uh, South Africa, another revolutionary constitutional scenario uh, of the 20th century, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, African National Congress uh, uh, is a, uh, 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 in large measure for a generation, uh, um, a military organization. Uh, 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 which engages in massive guerrilla warfare. Uh, 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 but sometimes, of course, during time one, um, I would think of a case like, uh, 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 most notably, India, to which we'll return, uh, uh, we see, uh, uh, here we have a mass mobilization led by Gandhi for a generation, then he passes it over and the movement becomes something which is going to be very important in this uh, talk, the idea of a movement party. Um, which then, in the 1930s, Gandhi resigns as head of the Congress party and hands over the torch to Nehru, a very different fellow indeed, who wants to win elections, <laughs> which, he, which he, the British permit him to make a serious a stab at in 1935 when they passed the Government of India Act. <clears throat> so um, that's time one, and then uh, after the uh, Second World War, the Congress party wins. Right. And in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, 1950, we have a constitution, 
back, we'll go back there uh, soon enough. Um, while revolutionary constitutionalism has had many victories in the last two centuries, it's also had many defeats. Great Britain, for example, repudiated the French Revolution as a model for legitimate change during the Napoleonic War. Instead of allowing outsiders to gain control and then revolutionize the system, uh, it has developed an insider path to constitutional development. No, 1832, the first Reform Act. Here are these screamers and yellers outside saying, you know, and, and mostly in secret and then presented to the voters in a, as a fait accompli uh, in a referendum to dramatically simplify. Uh, uh, um, I'll be returning shortly to consider the distinctive authenticity problems posed by other uh, elite bargains, uh, 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 the distinctive ones having to do with elite bargains between indigenous elites and military occupiers, which occur in, for example, in the contemporary world, uh, places like, uh, um, uh, po well, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, and not too successful. But of course, when we go back, we should look at, and I, we will look at, um, post-war uh, uh, Japan and Germany, as well as look at the European Union as an elite insider-outsider construction. But first I want to focus, go back to the revolutionary uh, paradigm. Uh, because one of the aims of my, uh, uh, this book, uh, um, is to see, to, to uh, take away the, uh, 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 the model of par the paradigmatic revolutionary state building that we inherited from the short 20th century, which is, of course, that the great, real, the real revolutions of the uh, 20th century were Lenin and Mao. And they were charismatic leaders. They built a, uh, institutions of energetic social movements, social uh, movement parties, hegemonic movement parties. Um, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, there were uh, cults of personality, is another way of talking about Charles de Gaulle as well as, as these people, um, you know, charismatic leaders um, um, uh, who then, in Weberian terms, as you might have noticed, I'm an admirer of Weber, um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, then uh, after their ener movement energy, they win, after their movement energy over time dissipates, and they create a bureaucrat, they try to create at least, a centralized autocratic, bureaucratic, top-down, in Weberian terms, rational bureaucratic state. That's what, how revolutions, real revolutions, occurred in the 20th century. Um, well, I want to say, let's begin with India, though. Now, you know, you, one of, I do have, uh, well, uh, that's for another time. Um, uh, what are the preconditions for democracy? You name it, India does not have it. Right? Massive poverty. These efforts to you know, link wealth with uh, dem constitutional democracy. Massive poverty. Massive ignorance. You know, illiteracy, va vast illiteracy. Right? No single language. Um, uh, uh, a caste system of social relations. And yet, for 65 years, corruption. And yet, for 65 years, this is the largest constitutional democracy in the world. How has this happened? Um, the... Um, well, uh, it really is, you know, uh, uh, the, um, they have, of course, a hegemonic party, just like Lenin has and just like Mao has. It's the Congress Party of India, a hegemonic party, mobilized you know, by Gandhi and then by 
Nehru, right? For generation, uh, they don't have a, they don't, it's not military, partly because of the Gandhi thing. That's an interesting point to notice, right? But they are hegemonic, right? Okay. Um, but, and it's only because of this massive, mobilized, revolutionary outsiders, you know, Nehru and, and Gandhi were in jail. Um, uh, they were enemies of the system. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, uh, it's only because of the capacity that we can, let me throw in, so I'm, I think that we should... Votes for everyone, votes, 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 you know. Well, I'm not going to give you the gory details of how the Duke of Wellington uh, was pushed to one side by Earl Grey and all this, but nonetheless, the outsiders didn't take over. See, the insiders said, hmm, you know, let's let these screamy, yelly people, we'll give them a strategic concession. They're in these grand principles, that's screamy, yelly stuff. The insiders make prudent concessions and generate precedents, not abstract principles, <laughs> um, which is, cons you know, you know in, in 1911, um, uh, when the king is threatening the House of Lords with packing the Lords beca because of another big, screamy, yelly thing going on, um, people are looking back to 1832, what actually happened? Oh, you know, was once somebody says one thing, there are lots of different interpretations of 1832, I assure you. Um, this is a very different brand of constitutionalism than, but it is constitutionalism, this idea they don't have constitutionalism in Britain is ridiculous, uh, than, you know, the uh, American or Indian uh, or South African grand principles, which have mobilized millions of people behind them. Okay. Um, the British uh, system of insider constitutionalism, we'll call it, has had not only effect in, in uh, Britain, but a profound effect in many Commonwealth countries, the most notably are Canada, Australia, and, um, uh, and New Zealand, but we can find many uh, influences in what was formerly the British Empire and to some degree beyond. Um, so we have then two ideal types, uh, outsider revolutions and insider evolutions. Um, there's a third type. See, you, if we're gonna have ideal types, I don't want 111, please. I don't want one. <laughs> I want some clear, simple ideas like outsiders taking over inside, insiders, you know, saying, nope, we hear you. Bloop. Oh, I guess, oh, you know, the outsiders are satisfied, sort of, in a grumpy way, you know, or at least they run out of steam. Um, the third model is the regime has a crisis, and insiders reach out to outside elites, outside elites, but they don't, but neither insiders or outsiders appeal for popular mobilized support. Beautiful case is Franco Spain. Franco is contemplating his death as we all try not to do, but he does and he um, says, you know, I'm going to appoint a king as my successor. Very odd, very fascinating juridical thing for a dictator to do, to appoint a king as his successor. He does that, uh, he trains up Juan Carlos and then he dies and Juan Carlos disappoints him. He doesn't support the phalangist state. He, uh, but he doesn't want to destroy it either. He um, uh, appoints a, a young guy, Suarez, who is, you know, uh, uh, who reaches out, as the saying goes, to uh, uh, Carrillo, who is the head of the Communist Party, who is a member of the elite, outsider elite. Not, he, as defined by the regime, he's an outsider. 
Um, and Carrillo and, and, and Suarez say, you know, let's not have another Spanish Civil War. That was a mistake. Let's just not do it. Let's have a, an elite bargain. Unlike the British kind of case, the evolution, insider evolution, it self-consciously bargained out with the others. Unlike the revolutionary model, there isn't a mass mobilization. It has a distinctive problem. Um, uh, I'll get to the revolutionary problem in a minute. Its distinctive problem is, we'll call it authenticity. So you see it in Spain, you know. Where were the Basques in this elite construction? Where were the Catalans? Not anywhere. <laughs> the Spanish Constitution is a, uh, uh, done by the elite so as to get into the European Union. So it has all the uh, lots of Enlightenment features to it. It was uh, negotiated in uh, Parliament. It's not only a leading, globally leading constitutionalist, it's also a public voice in the p debate in the United States, writing quite often in the New York Times and other widespread magazines and media. Today he will talk about uh, three paths to constitutionalism and their authoritarian alternatives. And as we always uh, do here in this distinguished lectures, we have two commentators. And the th rule is that these commentators are coming from different disciplines. So we have uh, Ruud Koopmans here. He is directing the Department on Immigration. I don't know exactly what he is. He is a kind of sociologist, but also political scientist. Uh, and then we have uh, Michael Hutter. He leads the Department of uh, Cultural Sources of Innovation. So we are looking forward. Welcome, Bruce, to the lecture. The floor is yours. One second here. This, aha, there's already, I've been anticipated here. Good. Uh, the beginning of this lecture, uh, uh, really, uh, it's taken a long time for, for it to generate, uh, 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 was uh, uh, when uh, my wife and I spent a year in Berlin uh, in uh, 1991 and 92. At that time, I was uh, a fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg, uh, and I wrote a book um, called The Future of Liberal Revolution uh, 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 about uh, the events in Eastern Europe. Um, and. Um, uh, I was, uh, you know, really, I really put my heart into it, and in four or five or six months, uh, there was a book, you know, and I showed it to Wolf Lepenese. He said, we have to translate it into German immediately. Uh, and so he took me to uh, Wolf Ziedler, who is the head of Ziedler Verlag, uh, who had read the book. I was really, most people in the publishing business uh, often offer me contracts, they'd never read the book. That's, you know, that's not what they do. Um, uh, he read it. He said, you know, this is really very interesting, uh, Herr Professor Dr. Ackermann, or whatever. Uh, he was a gentleman, you know, I mean, really, of the old school. Um, I only have one, one condition for publishing this book. We need a new title, Revolution doesn't sell in Germany. <laughs> and here it is, Ein neuer Anfang für Europa. <laughs> no. um, uh, and as you'll see, this, uh, this talk can be understood, among other things, as a meditation on uh, this uh, event of, uh, of uh, some years ago. <clears throat> okay. Uh, law, uh, let me just make sure I know what time it is. It's a quarter after six, okay. A law legitimates power. It's not enough for the state to force its citizens to obey. Coercion is governed by principle, or so official propaganda machines proclaim, sometimes, credibly. 
Constitutionalism is a part of this larger project of legitimation. But how do constitutions gain their claim to authority? How do they engage with other modes of legitimation uh, in each regime's ongoing effort to justify itself? I'll be exploring these questions in the spirit of Max Weber, who famously distinguished four ways in which power establishes its authority. Uh, by appealing to charisma, bureaucratic uh, rationality, tradition, or substantive rationality, substantive rights, correct us. It's past uh, time to move beyond Weber's famous list. I want to give constitutionalism a central place in a new series of ideal types that clarify the modes of authority uh, dominant in the 20th century, for the obvious reason that constitutionalism is <laughs> one of the foundational ways that power justifies itself today. Uh, uh, and by constitutionalism, I should say, is for me, uh, is not a, a, a synonym for liberal democracy or everything that you like.